Just for 30 seconds, let's just pray in tongues just for 30 seconds. Just welcome the Holy Spirit in right now. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your wonderful presence here this morning. I thank you, Lord, that every, every single demonic force, every single curse, every single hindrance, we thank you, Lord, right now that it will be eradicated in this place in Jesus' name. Every single uh, monitoring spirit, anything that is trying to hinder your people here this morning, we ask it to be removed right now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that even those who will be watching on live stream this morning, I thank you, Lord, that this word will penetrate every single person's heart here today, that they will be convicted to understand the reality of the church and the importance of why the church is in this place. I thank you, Lord, right now that even the people here today will have a greater hunger and a greater desire and love for the church of Christ. I thank you, Lord, that after the, this morning that your people will go after their family even more, go after their, their lost friends, their lost family members to come into the house of the Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you bring us a new reality of who you are and why you created the church, Lord. I thank you, Lord, right now that every single person here today, their hearts will be open, their minds are open, and their spirits will be open to receive the word. Every single thought that will try and creep in to try and distract, we command you to go right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for your presence that is already so freely available to us here this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. If you are able to find your seats, you are more than welcome to be seated. If you want to stand, hey, you can stand. <laughs> awesome. Are we excited to be in church this morning? I'm very excited. I believe this is going to be a powerful word. And I've done part one already last year. It was actually about a year ago I did part one. So I've changed it up a little bit. And, you know, for me, the church, the actual church, has done so much in my life. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the church. Because even during worship, I was thinking to myself, you know, even when I was in my rebellious stage, when I was still doing my own way, I will remember still being in church every single weekend. And I believe that still kept me. We, re, whether I wanted to be in church, whether I didn't feel like being in church, I still went because either my parents forced me or I had to be there. And I was still there. And I'm very, very grateful for those days because I could have been a lot further away or I could have backstood completely if it wasn't for me still being in the house of God. Whether I wanted to, whether I didn't want to, I was still here. So my message this morning is why the church is so crucial. And I'm hoping by the end of the day, we actually have a better revelation. And I know that a lot of you are here today have been the faithful ones. So this message is just going to enhance it a little bit more to show why church is so important. And I'm even live streaming today because there's a lot of people watching our live stream. A lot of people watching on YouTube and Facebook that need to hear this word. Because it's easy just to watch on live streams, it's easy just to watch on YouTube, it's comfortable in bed, and you come to church CEO, Christmas, Easter only, and you wonder why your life is in such a mess. So I'm going to be dropping some powerful pew pew hints, powerful words, <laughs> that I saw it like arrows going, that's my pew pew. So I want you guys to take notes, um, this is going to go on YouTube, it's going to go on everywhere, because there's so many people that don't realize why church is so important. So... I read a few articles, and there was a group of people, the church, that wanted to go out into the streets to see what people really think of the church. And they asked why church is important, or what does church mean to you? So the question they asked the people is, why is church so important? So they went around to some people, and a lot of the, about 80% of the people said, no, church is not important. I'll go for a funeral, a wedding, Christmas, that's maybe it. And some people said, no, I go every now and again, not consistently, once in a while I'm there. And very few of those people said, oh no, I go every week. I'm a weekly churchgoer. Very, very few. And this is what it says here. We continued on our, on the, on our man on street interviews and we came to a short, balding man with a beard who looks decidedly Jewish. Somewhat hesitantly, we asked him, sir, we're asking people the question, why is the church important? Would you care to comment? And we were hardly prepared for his answer. He says, I believe the church of Jesus Christ is the most important force in the world today. Its task is more important than all the governments, all the universities of the world combined. There is nothing that can compare to it. Amen. And it made me think there should be a church on every single corner of this country, of this world. Because if you consider there are seven, seven, eight billion people in the world, 
Every single one of those people should technically be in church. Churches aren't full. Even the biggest uh, mega churches are not full to capacity. They've got the vision to see people coming into the house of God, and they've prepared the vision, but why are the churches still not reaching their capacity? Why is it that people are not having that reality of the church? Why is it? So I did some more researching. So going to church is not about getting your attendance gold star, nor is it about gaining favor for the week. We all know we've had a sinful week. I'm going to go to church today. You know, just to do God a favor. We've said that many times. Some people, many people go to church just to, I'm here. I've ticked it off. That's my yearly duty. Uh, You know, I I gave my money. eh? I'm sorting out for the next year. And that's people's mentality. That is out there. It's uh, a noise about gaining God's favor for the week because you assemble together with his people. Church is not a place to go. Rather, it is a living body where God wanted to become a part of. And it's for your good and it's for his glory. Church is good for you, whether you want to believe it or not. You know, we were watching, we were, while we were away in the Drakensberg, we landed up watching the, the Women's FIFA World Cup. That's a different ball game altogether. Women playing soccer, they mean, 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 pulling their hairs, ponytails, spitting on each other. But anyway, so while we kept on watching the soccer, it was Cameroon versus England. So you can tell who's a Cameroon and who's um, from, that, from France. And there was this whole group of family from Cameroon that was sitting there. They had the kids. They were all kitted out in their Cameroon outfit. And suddenly it dropped. And I told Pastor Al, you know what just hit me? This family here of like six, five people, they bought tickets Overseas tickets, they crossed the whole nation, they crossed overseas, they kitted themselves out with all their decor, they are screaming their lungs out. Those guys are screaming. If you want to see people pray, it's in a soccer match, when people, when their team is not winning. (laughs) They're all praying there. And it made me think, here's this family that's gone all the way to France to support their team. And it made me think, not even Christians will go that far to come to church. I won't go to church because it's a 20-minute drive, or it's cold, I'm going to sleep in, or I, I don't have to be there every week. God knows my heart. I can come once a month. It should seal the deal. It keeps me solid. And there are people, I understand, that generally can't make church. I know those who are, that are bedridden and things like that. God has grace for those people. I really believe that. But it's a conscious decision as the body to show what's more important. And I heard a pastor say in America, in America apparently, they, all the kids' soccer tournaments all fall on a Sunday. Soccer tournaments, cricket, whatever's overseas, this guy was saying that all their kiddies' functions fall on a Sunday. And how the world system has made everything else more important than Sunday, coming to the house of God. Everything falls on a Sunday. Soccer's on a Sunday, soccer tournaments, the kids going um, on camps, you know. So, And as parents, you obviously want to go because it's your kids, but we don't even realize that the system is making Sunday not so important anymore. Everything else comes before the house of the Lord. And that's the complete opposite. So the world systems try to make you distracted from church. And church sounds really, when people talk about church, it's like it's two, an hour and a half, two hours, and it makes it sound like so long, like you sit in there for days at a time, and it's so grueling, yet uh, what's at Marvel Endgame was three hours long, and we'll sit through that thing like solid. You sit in exactly the same position. You're basically watching the same thing, but it's not the same as going to church. It's like going to church. I, think, I don't know if you've ever felt like when you come into church, like getting ready, it's like, uh, and you're like, but going for a coffee with a friend, you're ready, you're up and running, and I'm ready to go for coffee, ready to go on my date night, but getting ready for church just feels like it's like an extra two hours, and that cup of coffee, like, oh, you, you know what I mean, before you come to church, we've all been there, I was there this morning, you can ask Pastor, I was like, really? <laughs> so what does the church actually mean? So in the Greek, exclusilia, is that right, did I say it right? Okay, cool, because apparently I said the wrong word last week, scientifically, is not a word. So, oh, scientifical is not a word. <laughs> so, exclusia in Christian theology means a particular body of faithful people and the whole body of the faithful people. Also means called out ones, sent ones, called out ones, which means called out of the kingdom of darkness or the world system contrary to the kingdom of God and called into the kingdom of God. That is what the church means. Exclusia, called out of darkness, put into the kingdom of light. That is the church. It's not the four walls. It's not how nice the stage looks and all our advertising. No, no, no. That is the church. 
So I've said this a few times. A popular Christian social media face says, you don't go to church because you are the church. And I understand that statement because we are the body of Christ. However, I get the sentiment in some ways, but this is an unhealthy view, pitting being the church versus going to church against each other. Because I am the church, so I don't need to go to church because I am the church. It's gone against each other. You, it's a contrary phase there. If you are truly the church, like you say you are, then we will truly get together with other believers regularly. We cannot be the church if we don't go to church. How can you be a car and you've never been in the garage? You've never been on, this, on the plot. You cannot be the church if you don't go to church. And there's a lot of people on social media, a lot of people watching on live stream that have that mentality. I don't need to go to church because I am the church. And you are highly, highly deceived. That is deception level 101. When you get the handbook on deception at CNA, that's number one. That is deception because that is a lie. So Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. Now I'm reading the, tra- the Passion Translation, but we're reading the NLT. Discover creative ways to encourage each other and motivate them towards acts of, impa- acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing. What does it say here? Especially now the day, okay? Not neglect our meeting as some people already do. How long ago was the scripture written? Already then. People are already neglecting coming together because it says here, as people already do. Like it said here, it says here in the TPT, as some have formed the habit of doing. I've noticed something in all my, in all the ministry and all the times I've been away. It takes two to three week weekends of missing church. And already it's like a struggle to get back into it. And I've noticed people struggle with the habit of getting back to it. Mimi was away for just one weekend. She was away on holiday. And she comes back, she's like, it's so good to be back in church. <laughs> I'm so glad. Just one weekend, Corin and Peter, they were away for two weekends. They were away on holiday. And the other weekend, they had a family function. As they walked in, Peter was like, you guys have no idea how good it's to be back in church. I felt like it was gone forever. I felt like we missed out. That was just two weeks. Can you imagine if it went to the third week? And then what starts happening? Those old habits start creeping back in slowly and surely. Now that habit of sleeping in on a Sunday morning, which you used to do BC, starts creeping in. I'm going to get back into that. Okay. In fact, we should come together more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate the day drawing near. Jesus is drawing near. Why is the church not full? We are supposed to be one another, encourage each other, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. The times are getting darker. Why is the church not getting fuller? Why do people think I can handle my sin by myself? I can handle my own life by myself outside of the church of God, outside of coming to the the throne room, outside of coming to corporate worship. I don't understand it, okay? Matthew 18, 20. I'm reading the TPT. Uh, this is NLT. We're going to do the two translations. For whenever two or three come together in the honor of my name, I am there with them. For when two or three gather together as, as my followers, oh, I like this one. As my followers, I am there among them. There's a lot of Christians and there's a lot of followers. There's a difference. I heard Chris Valentine say the other day, um, a couple came to them and said, oh, Pastor Chris, can I still be a Christian and live with my girlfriend? And he's like, of course you can be a Christian, but you're not a follower and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Can I still sleep around outside of marriage and be a Christian? Of course you can, but you're not a follower of Christ because that's not what Christ did. So yes, Christian it's a, nice, it's a nice word. We all fit in everyone. When you go to the bank, Christian. I'm a Christian, but you are not a follower. Because we are supposed to follow God's example. So if God didn't do it, neither should you. Okay? That is not me speaking. It's here. It's not my context. It's the Lord speaking here. Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42. Sorry, Josh. 
putting you under pressure. There we go. The TPT version. Every believer was fully, faithfully devoted to the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. Regularly. Let's see what this one says. All the, as all the believers devoted themselves to the pot, devoted, that is like a, that's quite a significant word. It's not once in a while, every now and again, whenever I feel like it, devoted to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship. Why do you think we have coffee on a Sunday night? Do you think it's just for us to sit together, take some cute selfies and, oh, look, we had coffee as a church? No, no, no. Fellowship and to share meals, that's all this coffee and cake upstairs. We are fulfilling scripture. With all the calories and everything. And sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to pray. So this is a different version. So devoted to pray and to come into the house of the Lord. Okay, so now we're going to go a bit longer. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. NLT, NLT, awesome, same version. Now I'm gonna, it's going to be a bit long, but bear with me. You can read on the screen. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. Now that's a revelation right there as it is. So as it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we've all been baptized in one body by one spirit, and we share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that doesn't make it any less of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, that would not make it less any part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body was an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts and God has each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one pod. Can you imagine just like a toe walking around somewhere by itself? And that's what's happening in the spirit realm. There's a lot of hands by themselves, a lot of foots by themselves. If you looked in the spirit, it would look weird. Because that's what's happening out there. We have all said mental moments of like in the mall and there's like this little hand. <laughs> we are part of the body, Okay. Uh, how strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. You try walk without your big toe and tell me how your balance is. It's not very good. And all those parts regard as less honorable those we clothe with of the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. We all learned that in school. While the more honorable parts do not require the special care. So God has put the body together such that, it, such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes harmony among the members so that all members can care for each other. You know, I do my nails with Chantal every couple of weeks. I don't go there and be like, Chantal, let's just do this hand today. Let's just leave this hand to be ugly. Just focus on this side. We wax. Can you imagine, ladies, we only wax this side of our face and we let this side just grow out? That looks weird. That looks compromised. That doesn't look right. That's what the church looks like, okay? This makes harmony among the members so that all members will care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you are part of it. There are many people that feel I don't belong in church because I'm an outsider or I don't fit in or how is the church going to use me? You might be an ear, you might be a toe, but you are needed in the body of Christ. We all have giftings, we all have talents and when we come together, there's perfect unity and everyone works in perfectly and they fit together perfectly. So in none of that stuff, we will we stop with that thinking where I'm not important enough to go to church. I'm just this. I'm just that. Can you imagine, like even uh, the, uh, when was it, on Friday night, I was having, I had a bit of a daft moment. I was checking because we just sold my one car. So I wanted to check my reverse lights. So what I did, thinking I'll be okay, if the handbrake was up and I put the car in reverse, the car won't go, but it did. So I'm running across the 
parking lot here to run back into the Kia to quickly press the brake. And while doing that, I knocked my arm and I knocked my side here. So I'm all bruised here. And I was telling Pastor Al last night, just this little bruise here has actually hurt my whole arm. That even I could feel it in my arm because the way I banged it. So one little bruise has actually hurt my whole arm here. Just a simple little bruise. So that means my body is now affected. I can't operate without my left arm. I can't operate without my foot. I can't operate. Can you imagine if no one had a nose? You know, even the nose, everyone has a part to play within the ministry, in the church. Everybody. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. We all have a part to play. Colossians 1.18, the Passion Translation, and I think we're going to do NLT here. He is the head of the body, which, the ch- which is the church. And since he's the beginning and the firstborn, heir in resurrection, he is the most exalted one, holding first place in everything. Let's see this one. Christ, also the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning and the supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. So I want you to take note here. Christ is the head of the church. So if you are not part of the church, then Christ is not your head. It can't be. Because Christ has given authority to the church. So church, if you are part of the church, then Christ is your head. You cannot be outside because there is right there is the head of the church, which makes up the body. So if you're part of the body, then Christ is your head. Does that make sense? Amen. Ephesians 1, to 23. And he alone is the leader and the source of everything needed in the church. God has put everything beneath the authority of Jesus Christ and has given them the highest rank above all others. So now we, his church, are his body on the earth that fills him who is being filled by it. God, go back to 22, Josh. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him the head over all things and the benefit of the church. So in other words, God has given all his authority to the church. So if you want authority, it is in the church. You get it? You cannot have authority outside of the church. You might have power, but you've got no authority. The same thing with Satan. He's got power, but no authority unless you give it to him. Uh, Go to the next one, 23. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So we as the body of Christ have got all authority, all power to fulfill what God wants us to do on this earth. But it has to be within the church. You cannot be a lone ranger trying to fulfill the plan on your life outside of the church. And I'm going to go into more into that just now. So in other words, God has given all authority to the church. If we're not a part of the church, the body of Christ, we have power but no authority. Just like Satan, he has power but no authority. That's why those who are not in church cannot produce fruit. There needs to be fruit as a follower of Christ. Now we all know those people over our life that are born again, they have the most scriptures on Facebook. They've got the most Holy Ghost stuff that they put on Facebook, but they're never in church. What do their lives really look like? Honestly, are they not the first one that will come to you for prayer? Please help me. Please pray for me. But you haven't been in church. You haven't been in the body. And we know a lot, a lot of people, and they've come in and out of this church, in and out, in and out. They come when they want, and they treat the church like a prostitute. They treat Pastor Al, myself, and the pastors like prostitutes. You don't hear from them for the whole year. Suddenly, their husband wants to leave. Suddenly, they overdosed again on drugs. Pastor Al, 2 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, will you guys come and pray for me? I need prayer. We're like, where have you been? Oh, no, backslid for a whole year. Now they want God, a quick fix. No, but we, they don't want to come here. We must go there. That doesn't make sense. Yes, we are pastors and we go and we help people. There's a lot of members here. We'll drop whatever I do to come and help you. But those are those who have been faithful that I can see your heart. Can you imagine every single pastor, how much time will be drained from them? How much energy, how the enemy will steal time from their family to help those who are not committed to the house of God? If you had stayed faithful from day one, you would not have backslid. 
You would not have gone and had that affair. You would not have gone back on that porn if you stayed faithful in the house of God. I am losing my temper with many people. Spiritual temper. I'm a very sweet person. I don't get angry. <laughs> but my spiritual temper is on its edge because you, so many people are so down in their life, losing everything, losing their marriages, losing their work, but they will not step their foot in the house of God. And you wonder why your life is in a mess. Because you think you can handle your life outside of the church. Just because you put a scripture on Facebook does not mean you are born again. Does not mean you are saved. There are many people on Facebook, and I watch them over and over again. And I advertise, I send people messages. You guys know me. Make sure everyone is in so I don't lock the gates on you. But the thing is, I can force you as much as you want. Pastor Al has gone so many times to people's homes. We've prayed. We had people manifesting in their house, praying. And they'll be like, we'll be in church next week. And they'll be like, okay, praise God. We have never seen them again. What happened? We had a couple that came. One of Pastor Rosie's friends came to the house of God. They were living together. They weren't even married. The, the boyfriend slash fiance slash husband, we don't even know where they were. He was a drug addict. One Sunday night after church, God did something with that man. He, he vomited upstairs. He was getting delivered. God was doing something. So then they said, okay, Pastor Al, Pastor Nats, will you please come to our house and do a cleansing? A Sunday night after church, we get into our car. We drive all the way to Edenville at 9 o'clock at night, and we're doing a house cleansing. We are praying. We're coming against things in the house. We're coming against spirits in the house. They were so excited. They felt so free. I'm so excited. I finally found a church that I could be a part of, and my husband, my fiance, whatever he is, he's finally free. We'll be in church on Wednesday. Wednesday morning, Pastor Rosie phones me. Did you know he backslid? He went on the drugs the next day, and he left the house. He's living on the streets. And Pastor Rosie never heard from them again. Not one time. After encountering the presence of God, a simple act of getting in your car and coming to God to maintain your deliverance was too much for you. That now that man is on the streets. What more is the church supposed to do? A lot of people say, but you're not showing love. Go and find the man. Go and find him on the streets. How is that going to help? It's his choice now. It's a choice. You know where the church is. I don't have to put the address on Facebook. You know how many people still message me, what's the address? And I'm like, you've been here twice. You know where we are. Come to the house of God. If you want freedom in your family, if you want freedom with your kids, with your business, it's in the house of God. It is in the house of God. You cannot live this life outside of the church. Not even God did things by himself. If God didn't need help, he wouldn't have created all of us. But he still did. And I know I'm sounding really mean. I love you guys. You know how I am. But it's for those watching on live stream that are going through this mentality, think that I can be an apostle, I can be a prophet. Outside of the church, you have no authority. You have no power. Because you are not submitted to the church. Who do you think you are calling yourself apostle, prophet, so-and-so, and you haven't even been in a church for a year? You can't even stay faithful for two months in a church. Now you think you're going to go start a church. Good luck. We are a church under authority. When Pastor Algic and myself need advice regarding the church, we don't go all Lone Ranger. We go for advice and counsel to our oversight, to our authority, and we sit there and we listen. If we need correction, we will do that. There are many times I'll take correction from my members. I'll take correction from anyone. Because I am, this is not my ministry. Have you seen Algic and Natalie's ministry? It is his ministry. And it's time the church, the reason why the world is not saved is because the church is not rising up. The church is supposed to be overcoming uh, uh, the government, overcoming the universities, but we are not doing that. Because church is just an obligation. I come when I need something, when my job, when I've lost my job, when my wife is on her way out. Then I want to come to the church and be on my knees and come to the throne and be like, Jesus, have your way. And Jesus is like, sorry, your name is? Because the Bible says, depart from me, I did not know you. The word know is gnosko, it means as a man knows his wife. So God doesn't know, who are you? Oh, yeah, the last time I saw you was a year ago when you still had your fancy car, you still had your, your Merc. Now you've lost everything. Your wife is on her way out with the kids. Now you want to come to me. It's being treated like a prostitute, the church. The church is not a hooker. It's not a harlot. Jesus says he's coming back for his church, not one person, not an individual, his church. Are you guys loving me still? 
I know I'm probably going to get emails and stuff, but that's not. The scriptures are all there. I'm not making this stuff up, okay? Ephesians 5.22, NLT. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of his church. (laughs) So that means we are supposed to submit to the church as a wife submits to her husband. I don't only sub. Can you imagine being partially married? Like I'm married for two months out of the year. All the other months I'm like dating other guys and I'm doing my own thing. But then I'm married again and then I'm not married again. That is how the church is being treated. People are having an affair with the world and still coming to church thinking they're married. No, 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 no. You've compromised. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. There's that word again. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present to her himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or blemish. Instead, she'll be holy and without fault. So God uses the church as an illustration of what a marriage is, an illustration of what church should be. As a husband and wife submit to each other, have commitment with each other. You know the Bible says, uh, when you do your vows, till death do us part in sickness and in health, you have a sneeze and you don't come to church for three weeks. And I know some people generally get sick, but I'm just using an example. How the enemy will say, no, no, no. You know, you, you sneeze twice this morning. You can't go to church today. Swine flu is going around. The church has more authority over that sickness, over that disease, over their authority. Don't allow the enemy to steal from you. That's what he does. That little sniffle, that little keeps you away from church. We need to be as committed and faithful to the church as you are committed to your spouse. In everything. In sickness and in health. When Pastor Al was in hospital with pneumonia two years ago, I didn't say, well, it's been a good three months. You're sick now. And it's time for me to move on. Find another husband. And then when he gets better, are you better now? Praise God. Let's get our marriage back going again. That is how people are treating the church. That's exactly. So now this is the amplified version of Ephesians 5.22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. That's a key, men, a woman. To your own husband. Don't say be submitted to someone else's husband. That's what I'm going to say for that, Okay. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. Next. For the husband is the head of the wife as, ch- as Christ is the head of the church. Like I said, if, if you are not a part of the church, Christ is not your head of the church. Himself being the savior of the body. Okay. But as the church is subject to Christ, also the wives should be subject to their husbands in everything, respecting both their position as protector and their responsibility to God as the head of the house. Next. Husbands, love your wives, seek the highest good for her, and surround her with caring, unselfish love, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That right there should be our mentality. Love her. Seek the highest good. That's why the Bible in so many scriptures said, when you first seek the house of God, your house will be taken care of. Your family will be taken care of. There is power in that. Okay? Uh, Next one. So that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of the water, by the word of God. Have you noticed that the cleansing happens in the church? If you want to be set free from sin, you want to be God consulted, get you in your, in your bedroom at home, but the cleansing and the sanctification happens within the church, okay? A washing of water with the word of God next. So that in turn, he might present the church to himself, glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would have be wholly set apart for God and be blameless. That is what the church is supposed to look like. Instead, churches all over the world are having affairs breaking out everywhere. Pastors are addicted to pornography. Pastors are doing all of these things, having affairs, and the members are in the exact same condition. Because no one is teaching sin is still sin. Hell is still hot. And it will take you there. The wages of sin is 
death. If you want to be a drug addict, you're eventually going to overdose. If you, if you want to be an alcoholic, eventually you are going to have liver, kidney problems. Eventually it leads to death. But when we are in the house of God, God will restore us. He will keep us. Okay. So Jesus loves the church and he laid down his life for the church. So if Jesus loves his church and laid down his life for it, how much more so should we lay down our fleshly desires, our ones, and be in the house of God? We are not led by our flesh because the flesh will always keep you from church. Always. If, for an example, a Sunday morning comes around and you're ready for church and your friend says, no, but I got us these tickets for the front row seat for the biggest celebrity out there. You know, all seats paid, dinner included. That sounds pretty good, right? Your favorite celebrity, your favorite singer. Then you kind of start to think, oh, you know what? God understands. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. The flesh will always choose the comforter over being in bed. He will always choose other things than being in the house of God. Always. And this is not a condemnation message, okay? I want people to understand the reality of the church so we can succeed in every area of our life. So reasons why the church is so important. I've got 11 reasons why the church is so important. Number one, church is where you find peace. There's a lot of Christians with no peace because they're not in the house of God. You need to be in the house of God to find peace. It's where you find directions and answers. There's been so many times I've been in a church service and, you know, something hits me and afterwards I realize, oh, so-and-so would have loved this message because we've just been talking about this. If only they were here, they could have had revelation, they could have had understanding about this situation, but because they weren't there, they missed out. There are times when you, we've learned something. There's times when you don't feel like being in church is the day the Lord will speak to you the most when you're not in church that day. Because, that's, because the enemy knows if you are in church, you're going to hear something that's going to set you free, that's going to make sense. So what happens? Everything wants to be more comfortable at home. Now suddenly you're not feeling well, you can't be at church, or the enemy just comes to bring a distraction, or the kids are making too much noise, and it's just chaos, chaos, chaos. Like, okay, it's easier just to stay home today. It's just too much chaos. We've all been in that place, even me. But now we need to overcome that because like the Scripture said, the day is drawing near. Even more so, we need to be running even more into the things of God, running further. It's like Pastor Patsy last week when she said even when she ministers that she feels strength and she's got the power and the, she feels the, the fire and able to minister. She doesn't let anything stop her. How much more so with us? We need to keep on being pushed, push, push, push. Number three, we need to gather together in worship and the Word. It's one thing just watching on live stream, watching on YouTube, but you don't get wet. You can't have a shower and not be wet. You need to be in the house of God. There's a lot that happens in here that is not happening online. That's not happening on YouTube, but you are missing out because you're not there. So you think oh, you're getting all this revelation, you're getting all of this, but you're actually missing what's being caught right here. Does that make sense? Number four, staying committed to the church helps with a disciplined spiritual lifestyle. If you can grasp coming to church every week, as difficult as it may be, and some of us may need to start the process again. Those watching on live stream may need to get back into, you know when you start exercise, you start off slow. You don't go right for the big weights. You start off slow. Maybe we need to go back and start again. Because, you know, it takes three weeks to break, a, to break a habit. And how long to start a habit? Less than that instant. So three weeks it takes to break a habit. So if you, the guys are watching on live streaming on YouTube, if you are struggling to get back into church, it's time to start the process because you will experience victory and joy like none other in the house of God. Amen. There are many, many people here, or not here on, on live stream and all of that, that are saying, I don't need to be in church. My walk with God is fine. It's not. Your walk with God is not fine. How can it be fine if you're not in church? The church is the body of Christ. You're missing out on so much, and you think you're okay with God, and you're not. Number five, now this is the natural part of being in church. Proven to lower blood pressure. How cool is that? Stress and help with insomnia. Insomnia. What? That one where people can't sleep, okay? <laughs> Scientifically speaking, okay. 
Those are just the natural benefits that those who attend church regularly have lower blood pressure, have less chance of heart attack as well, a less chance of heart attack, experience more peace, and also sleep better. I feel so sorry for those out there who are not a part of this. Because that is just a natural benefit of being in the house of God. Number six. This is a big one. Highlight the number six. Keeps you from backsliding. Helps you overcome sin and temptation. There are many people in church that are still struggling with temptation and sin. And I'm going to get to that point just now. However, if you're struggling to overcome that temptation in the church, how much are you going to struggle outside? If you can barely struggle to overcome your sin in the church, where there's grace and there's protection already available to you, how are you going to do it outside of the church? How on earth are you going to overcome that? Because I'm telling you now, I'm just going to use porn as an, addic- as, a, an, as an addiction, as an example. If a young man is struggling with porn in the church, let's just use an example. He's struggling to break free. He has moments of freedom, and then he slips again, moments of freedom, and then he slips. And at some point, he says, you know what? This church thing is not for me. You know, maybe I'll do better outside. Maybe I can handle this outside. The minute he walks out of that door, he has handed himself over even more so to that sin. Because while he was here, the word was still being preached, worship was still happening, he was still a part of that. So the Lord was still keeping him from the, uh, the consequences of that sin. But once he's out there, he doesn't have people to pray for him anymore. There's no corporate worship, there's no hugs, there's no smiles. That actually people, some people just, as they walk in and they get a hug and a smile, there's already a break already. Because that's sometimes that's all they needed. It helps you keeps you from backsliding, overcome sin and temptation. There's time and time again, and there's many of us here that can testify. We've seen they've come to the church, have powerful deliverance. God touches them. They say, God has set me free. Do we see them again? Where are they now? Back on drugs. Back on the alcohol. Back on the streets. Not because we did anything wrong. Not because the church did anything wrong. But because they didn't maintain that deliverance. They didn't maintain it. They should have been even more. When the doors open, I need to be in church. I don't have the drugs come back in. The alcohol, the porn, it doesn't come back in. That's why Pastor Aldrich has not backslided in almost 10 years. Because when he got born again, every night of the church, uh, every day that the church was open, he was in church. I'm not asking you all to be here five, six days a week, okay? If you want to, it'll just be even more beneficial. But because of that, he never backslid. He still went through temptations. He still had old friends that were trying to bring him back. Can you imagine if he stepped out of that? This would not be here today. This church would not be here today. Number seven, you bring all your tithes and offerings to the house for financial breakthrough and stability. Okay? Even those who are outside who are not born again, if you look at the really wealthy guys, um, Bill Gates and those guys, if you actually see how much they give, they are working that biblical principle and they're not even in the church. So they are wealthy because the scripture still remains the scripture. You give, you will receive. So they are wealthy. They might be outside of the house of God. Can you imagine if they were? They'll be trillionaires, not just billionaires. Because now they're applying the faith and the biblical principle even more so than being outside of church. So it gives you the opportunity to bring your finances to the house of God so God can bless you. God can do more with your 90% than your 10%. He will bless the 90% and the 10%. Uh, what did Jesse DePlante to say this week? He said, I'd rather have my 90% blessed than my 100% cursed. Okay, we all, we've gone through that, but you know what I mean. The, the tithe alone rebukes the devourer for your good. If you want financial breakthrough, you want freedom in your business, it's in the house of God. There are so many people who are outside, oh, sorry, outside of the church, battling financially, battling. And I'm said, when was the last time you guys were in church? No, it's been about six, five months. And they're trying to work this business themselves, where here's God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, that wants to help them, that wants to teach them ways to break free, to succeed, but they think they can do it by themselves. And you can't. And you will keep on going deeper and deeper and deeper until you say, enough is enough, and now I'm coming to church. And so many people, we've seen it time and time again, even in this house, they come to church begging, Lord, I make a promise to you, I make a covenant to you that if you give me a job, I will tithe. So God honors that and he gives them a job. Never see them again. 
The last time I saw this person, they'd come back six months later, they'd lost their job, even worse off than before. Why? You didn't maintain the blessing. You didn't maintain your relationship with God. And God actually, okay, well, since you've done that, he took his hands off that blessing. He couldn't keep it for her because she didn't keep to her word. And that's happened many times. Pastor Patsy, when she started tithing, you've heard her testimony. She said, if you, if you make my business succeed, I promise I'll tithe. And she has stuck to that covenant how many years later? And that's why they're so successful. They never backed away from that. That's just one example of someone sticking to their word. And God has honored that word in their life. And you see it in their families. Number eight, proven to, bring, to build stronger families and marriages. If your marriage is on the rocks, if your families are on the rocks, they need to be in the house of God. If you still got young kids, you force them to come to church. I don't care if they're 15 years old, throwing tantrums. You say, baby, put on your shoes. We're going to church. I'm not ready yet. I don't care. You get in the car. Because they will thank you. I thank my parents for forcing me to come to church. Because even if they're playing games in the service, their little spirits are still picking up something. And it will keep them, that seed has been planted. So even when they drift away, they will, they have to come back. Because the Word of God says, raise them up in the ways of the Lord and they will not depart. They might drift, but they will not depart. But it's our responsibility as parents to force them. And they say, well, but he's 18 years old. Hey, if you're under my roof, my rules. Church is a part of the package. If you don't want to be under the authority, you can pay your rent for your room. You know, you can buy your own food. If you want to be an adult and make your own decisions, <laughs> that's how it is. If you are in my roof, church is a part of the package. Pastor Al and myself have already got protocols in plan ready for the kids, and they're not even here yet. They probably just heard that. They're like, oh, snap, I'm going to get it when I come down. <laughs> Because Pastor Al said, oh, you want to go out with your friends on Saturday night? Oh, you want to go to movies? Number one, church first. Amen. Then you'll get rewarded. They're not, if they think they're going to play soccer on the weekends and Fridays and they're not going to be in church, they've got another thing coming. Because they have to first be in the house of God and everything else flows from that. That is scriptural, Matthew 6.33. Number nine, encourages us and strengthens us. I don't know if you've ever felt like you've had such a rough week. All you can think about is, I can't wait to come into worship. Just raise my hands and let it all go. Okay? What do you do when you're not in church? More stress. Now you're thinking about it and, oh, I have to do this. No, no, no. Worrying, anxiety, oppression, anxiety. Where it was so simple. Just come into church and say, okay, Lord, take it. That is what happens when we come in corporate. It's like what I said when I did part one. When we go to heaven... You are not in your own little cubicle worshiping God. You're not all by myself and all the hundreds and millions will be on that side. You worship God together. So if we can't even worship together next to your brother and sister, you're not going to be happy in heaven. Because you're all on top of each other. You're all sharing the one communion cup. <laughs> We're all together in the body, in church. That's why it's so important to be in the house of God. Number 10, this is another important one. God commands it. It's not a suggestion. It's a necessity. You have to be in church. That is scriptural. Jesus even said he went to the temple as per his custom. You know, Jesus even paid temple taxes. Jesus tithed. Jesus gave to the house of the Lord. Jesus was in church every week. Jesus, and we're supposed to be followers of him. Therefore, following means doing, means copying what he did. The Bible goes even further to say, Jesus said, they will do even greater than what I did. So the church should be doing even more than what in those days. And we are not. The church in general, in the world, is in shocking, shocking condition. There's um, Pr Pr Prophet Patricia King is doing exactly the same series. I saw on YouTube saying 10 reasons why you need to be in church. And she hammered it. This is not even me hammering it. <laughs> Because the people are battling in their life, people are battling in their ministries because they think they can do it themselves and they can't. So God commands the church is not a suggestion but a necessity. You cannot live a Christian life outside of the church. So if you've got family here today who are in and out to church once in a while, now and again, I'm hoping that by the end of today you'll have more of a tenacity to say, hey, my brother, my sister, you need to be in church. The reason why your marriage is where it is is because you're not in church. The reason why your business is because you're not in church. 
There are many people that say to me, Pastor Nat, I don't need to be in church because I love Jesus. Hey, that's good and well, but that's not going to get you anywhere. Because Jesus is not your head. You can love him as much as you want, but he's not your head. How are you going to manage? Number 11, there is protection in the church. Protection. God gives grace and he protects. Now listen to this. James 4, we all know, submit to God, submit to God resist the devil. There's a key there. Remember Ephesians? A wife submits to God as the church is submitted to Christ. So if you are not in church, you are not submitted to Christ. It means you can't resist the devil. You can't because you are not submitted to Christ. You can't resist the devil. And you wonder why there's rampage in your family, in your lives, in your business, because you are not submitted to Christ. That's scripture. I didn't make that up. You can take it before the Lord. I know I'm going to get ugly letters, but it's fine. But that is the truth. Submit to God first, and then you resist the devil. It's not the other way around. So when you are submitted to church, submitted to the authority in the church, submitted to God, only then can you resist the devil. It's not the other way around. That's why there are so many apostles, prophets, fake apostles, fake prophets that are trying to be submitted to God, but they can't because they're not submitted to a church. Therefore, they can't submit to. So that's why they're going to funny doctrines, funny deliverances, funny things, because they're not submitted to church. They're not submitted to Christ. So I know those who are here, you are submitted to Christ, and you have given him everything. James 4, submit to Christ and then resist the devil. I know all of you here have been the faithful ones. I'm just hoping this message is going to encourage us even more to go after those who are in and out of church, those who are church hopping, even worse. That's a whole new message altogether. Church hopping can be even worse. No, I'm in church. Which one? Three different ones in one month. You've got so much mixed wine happening in you. I don't even know where you're coming or going. And today you believe in deliverance and tomorrow you don't believe in deliverance. And there's absolutely no fruit in your life. God requests fruit. There are many people who have got four years of Bible school, four or five years of Bible school, but they're not in church. They want to take over the world. They want to raise the dead. They want to build churches, but you see them once every three months. How can God trust you with that when you can't even be submitted to the house of God? Lord, give me the millions, but you can't even put 10 rand in the offering basket. Ouch. It's true. You know, on our way back from uh, Drakensberg, we were listening to the audio Bible, and in Mark, where it says that Jesus sat at the offering basket, seeing who was putting what in. Can you imagine if Pastor I was on that and we're like, okay, come, guys, show me what you got. Can you imagine <laughs> the church? You'll be in the news the next day, I'm telling you. <laughs> so we won't do that ever. <laughs> but Jesus did that. So those who are watching on live stream now, those who are watching on YouTube, I'm warning you, get into the house of God. This is a device of the enemy. Remember I did that series? This is one of the devices. The enemy does not want you to be in church. That's why he attacks it so much. Because there's power, there's breakthrough, and there's freedom in the church. No matter how bound you are in your sin, in your sickness, in your oppression, whatever it is, when you come here, the more you start coming, it's like a wall that gets knocked. And then the walk starts breaking, starts breaking. The second you walk out and say, I don't need this, that wall comes back up with barbed wire, electrical fencing, security guards, and you cannot get through there. That's why we are at a place now, while we were praying yesterday, as pastors and leaders and the future leaders of the church, if people need help, step one, come to church. Step one is you need to be in the house of God. There's no point in me coming to you every week, praying for you, laying hands, putting anointing oil all over you. I can make a salad afterwards. And you are never in church. It doesn't make sense. Because when you hear, you are re receiving a now word for you, for this ministry. So it's one thing watching this video in three years' time on YouTube. It is not going to be the same as when it was preached now. There's a lot of people who are the TVN Christians, the faith TV Christians. Oh, uh, Jesse DePlant is on now at 9 o'clock. Come, guys, let's all stand together around the church. Got our coffee, got our popcorn, 20 minutes, word, you know, a five-minute advert in between. And you think you're getting closer to God. And you think that is church. That is not church. That's deception. 
Yes, you might have received knowledge. Yes, you might have received the revelation. But there's no point in having any of that and you're still in that same place. There's no breakthrough in their life. I've had people try and prophesy in my life. Pastor Nat, the Lord has shown me. So I'm like, bring it on. And I know this person hasn't been in church in over a year. What are you going to prophesy to me? I shelved that thing before they even opened their mouth. I'm like, shelf it. Okay, let's hear. Because how can you be prophesying? How can you want to be doing the things of God when you're not in church? It all starts here. So many people want to go out and change the world, raise the dead. But when I ask you to come and pre- to, do, to just open up in prayer, you suddenly freak out and you've got stage fright. But yet, Lord, give me the nations. <laughs> it starts here first. This is training ground. So, so many people want these big callings. Oh, there's so many people that want to start churches and they're not even in church. And I'm like, Yo, you guys are in for a wake-up call. This is not a clock out, 9 a.m., 5 p.m., This is all the time. This is our life. Running the church is our life. The people is our life. When when, when it was Pastor Al's birthday yesterday, I don't know how many messages came through to him having the same thing. Thank you for laying down your life. Thank you laying down your life because that is what we do. It's not the the congregation's job to lay down their life. It's the leaders. You lay down your life for Christ, and in doing that, you will know how important it is to be in church. You know, it's one thing when we invite someone to come to church. We're like, praise God, they came to church. But then it's like a once-off thing. You need to keep encouraging them. Why don't you put your hand up? Because I was telling him on, I was telling Pastor Al on Friday that, you know, some churches, when they do the altar call, they say, put up your hand. If you want to receive Christ, they put up their hand. And they say, okay, the next step is come to the front. It's the same principle. Once you've received your deliverance, once you've received your healing, your breakthrough, now you need to step out and do it. Come to church. Come and maintain your salvation because we have now acknowledged that you can lose your salvation. Grace for all doesn't work. Once saved, always saved is not truth. Can I tell you why? Because we had a lady here who was full of demons, but yet praying in tongues, so-called, raised up in church, manifesting, attacking Pastor Aldrich. Was that woman saved? Does she have salvation? No. No. So there are many people in church today 3,000 churches, 5,000, but how many of those are actually going to heaven? How many of those are actually making an impact? How many of those are actually free? We went to see Prophet Andre a couple of weeks ago, and he said something so powerful. He said, a church's success is not about how many people are there, but how many people are producing fruit and how many people are actually going out and doing the things of God. Because you can have 3,000 people, and it's only the pastors that are doing, laying hands, seeing breakthrough in their life, but everyone else is bound. That is not a successful ministry. It's those who are doing, those going out, praying for people, encountering God, this breakthrough. I can see there's fruit in people's lives when they're experiencing breakthrough, when they are praying. We know who's praying. This is a praying church. If you want more breakthrough, come to prayer on a Saturday. There's no excuse for people who can't be here on a Saturday. I know those who are working, but if you're really, really going through things in life, come in prayer. Don't only come when the, when the poo-poo hits the fan. Now I must come to prayer on Saturday. No, no, no. The reason why we've overcome so many storms by prayers we've prayed years ago already, that we are still living on prayers from years ago. We are building our faith. We're building our prayer life. So today, I want us, we're just going to play one worship song. And I think, Pastor Patsy, we're going to just come to the front. And if you are here today and you've maybe realized, maybe I've been in church, but I've not actually realized how important it is to be in the house of God. Or maybe I've neglected the house of God. Those watching on live stream, YouTube, this is also for you here as well. And I want us to all repent today if we've neglected the house of God. Whether it was because our lives just got too busy and we just didn't realize it, or things we put things above the house of God, or we just put other things, bus- we made ourselves more busier than what God wanted us to be. Today we're going to let that stuff go. And we're going to say, Lord, give us a hunger and a passion for the church again. There's that song that we sing, church on fire, set your church on fire again. It starts with us. It starts with us. So today we are going to let it go to God and say, Lord, help us have a deeper hunger. Help us to go after our family members that are not in church, that are not born again, and bring them into the house of the Lord. Because once they are here and they can keep it going, they will succeed in every area of their life. Pastor Patsy, have you got anything you want to add? You're good. So right now we're just going to have the lights off. 
and we're going to have the song play.